Okay, um, so we're recording now, so you should have had something pop up on your screen to let you know um, that's the case. Um, so we've called this meeting um, because um, of the fact that, of course, our arts and culture sector have been hard hit by the pandemic, and we want to look at what we can do to address the issues and for us to have a recovery for our sector going forward. Um, my name again is Zita Holborn and I'm the Joint National Chair of Artists Union England alongside Lorraine Monk who is um, also, also here in this meeting this evening. I'm also um, a Vice President of the PCS Union and a multidisciplinary artist. I'm a visual artist, of course, because I'm part of AUE, but I'm also an author, a performance poet, a vocalist and a curator. So I have felt the impacts of the pandemic um, firsthand across the arts um, platforms that I, I work on. Um, members of AUE have been hard hit. The majority of our members are low paid. The majority are women. Um, we established an artist solidarity fund to try and help our members financially through this period. We've lobbied the government, um, contributed to um, the um, working of cultural recovery manifest manifestos through our um, structures that I'm involved in, in the public sector um, union uh, networks across Europe and uh, internationally as part of European Public Services Union and Public Services International, where I wrote um, uh, a culture strategy for recovery for PSI. Um, we have um, a, a distinguished and excellent panel of um, speakers who you're going to hear from shortly. And I will introduce them one by one just before they speak and say a few words about them. Um, I have to give some apologies from Sonali Bhattacharya, who was one of our panel speakers, but is unable um, to join us today. On Sunday at TUC Congress, which many of you here may have tuned into or been part of as a delegate, there was a composite um, motion on um, these related issues that was carried, and it was actually made up of five separate motions and two amendments. Um, and um, it included the two motions that AUE submitted. It was moved by equity, seconded by the Musicians Union, and there were speakers from AUE, PCS Prospect and FDA. Um, and it's a broad ranging uh, motion, which covers investments in the arts and culture, funding, education, pay, employment, and much more. And I don't intend to go into the details of that, motion that some of the speakers may may reference um, the, the, the composite, but you can access that and perhaps somebody um, from our team will put it in the chat from the TUC Congress website and actually it was recorded so you will be able to see and play back the debate that happened if you would like to. Um, so I'm going to move to um, our um, speakers who will talk about what they would like to see, how they think this can be achieved, and what we can all do um, uh, collectively. And once we've um, heard from our speakers, we're going to open it up for contributions from the floor, and then I'm going to come back to our speakers um, to, to sum up and, and say some final words and respond if there are some questions. And um, I would ask that when we reach that stage, that if you would like to speak, that you indicate by um, raising your virtual hands, because it will be easier for me to, to see your virtual hand. But if that's not possible, you can wave at me and I'll try and scroll through the screens to see you. And when we get to that stage, I'll explain if you need to know how to do that. There is um, auto captions um, available. And so you should see something pop up on your screen to tell you how to access that if you would like to have the auto captions, but bear in mind that it is auto captions. 
so that it doesn't necessarily um, capture exactly what we've said. It's what it thinks um, <laughs> we've said. So it can be a little bit comical at times, but it should give you the, the gist of the um, conversation that's taking place. So um, our first speaker is Paul Fleming. And Paul is the General Secretary of Equity UK, the trade union representing more than 47,000 performers and creative practice, practitioners working in the arts and entertainment industry. Paul joined Equity in 2011 as the, uh, the union's youngest organiser and went on to become Central London Theatre's organiser. Paul is also the Vice President of FIA, which is the International Federation of Performer Unions. Thank you very much, Paul, over to you. Um, thanks, Eta, and um, thanks everybody for uh, coming. I'm a slight fraud in opening this up because um, our Vice President, Linda Rook, uh, who I think is on the call somewhere today, um, gave the superb speech at the TUC yesterday, which I think you can watch back um, online, which sets out, and she set out in, in, in a way much more clear and much more engaging, I'm sure, than, than, than I will, what the big asks are and where we as arts unions are united in demanding something a bit different um, and a bit better. Um, I'll come to that in a minute, but for those of you who are perhaps less familiar with equity, um, as Zita said, you know, we represent 47,000 there or thereabouts um, of, of, of creative practitioners, which broadly includes performers, directors, designers, choreographers, stage management, variety artists, singers, audio artists, clowns, circus performers, and so on, the whole gamut um, of people um, whose work you see on stage. And our mission as a trade union, common to the mission of every trade union, is to ensure that working people can flourish as artists. And we do that as trades unionists, no matter what sector you work in, by improving rates of pay, improving the work-life balance, delivering education, um, delivering childcare, liberating people from the misery and drudgery of work to enable, enable them to flourish. Right. Us, so, in the form of our are you um, Can I ask that people put themselves on mute? You're not speaking. Sorry, Paul. That's all right. Um, so, so... And that is our kind of common mission within the trade union movement, um, common to all trade unions. Uh, however, equity as a union, and indeed all of the artists unions that are represented here today, have a slightly separate mission as well. And that is to ensure that work um, is not just the, it. Well, for, for, for many of our members, art can be as oppressive a concept as work when they um, are engaging with it. So, um, to, to, to put as an example, this bohemian idea that what you've got to do is suffer for your art, the show must go on, can be used very often against our members um, in, in their work. And it means that they are more likely to suffer things like low pay, things like harassment, things like discrimination, because they are made to feel by an entire institutional setup that that is what they are supposed to do. So not only as a union are we making sure that all working people have access to good art, we are also making sure that all artists have access to good work. And that is the big balance that we're trying to strike in this motion. And it might seem a bit odd to be at a fringe where we talk about the rebuilding um, of the culture sector to perhaps reject the entire premise. This isn't about rebuilding the culture sector. This is about building something new. Um, because actually, how many of us were happy with the way in which our sectors worked um, in March 2020. Could we truly say that it was a representative, diverse workforce um, engaging in a democratic way with audiences where we have um, a genuine thriving cultural sector that's inclusive for all, that delivers decent wages and delivers respect and dignity at work? Clearly not. If that was the case, we wouldn't be here as unions, would we? That is our bread and butter, standing up to that sort of oppression. So the big conversation for us to have tonight and the big conversation that our motion tries to start um, is this conversation about what do we build in its place? This thing that coronavirus tore down, what do we put back? And a very simple answer is in the name of equity's policy document, which is performance for all. That means performance for all audiences and performance for all artists as well. Um, and I suppose I'm just gonna generally talk about the asks under three headings. 
um, which are three things which I constantly repeat to any uh, body who will listen, um, which is to regionalize, to democratize and to cooperatize. So to regionalize is about making sure that we are not a single center in London of a particular sort of person who is able to access art and culture and become an artist. It is about genuinely making sure that every artist from every art form is able to access public funding everywhere in the country. That includes what we might call our variety members, um, you know, sole traders working on their own. Why don't they have equal access to public funding up and down the country? That is a huge, huge question. We still live in a country where there is a disproportionate amount of money spent on culture in London and the South East and the casting um, that reflects that. That pushes up the cost of living, pushes up the cost of living for Londoners, pushes up the cost of living for artists forced to move to London and the South East. Um, it is part of a general trend that all trade unions want to see of a, to use, to use a phrase that somebody else has got, a levelling up um, across the country. But just pushing funding outside doesn't work. You've also got to move to a position where we democratize the creative industries. And what do we mean by we say when we say that? We mean a genuine participation of audiences of all types in the art that they consume. Are we genuinely representative as a sector? Are you able to get ahead and have a stable um, life as an artist if you come from a black background, if you are a disabled artist, if you are um, from the full spectrum of the LGBTQ plus community, if you are an immigrant artist, if you are a working class artist, if you are a woman artist? Those are the big questions that we have to ask. And frankly, the system is currently coming up short. And a big way in which we want to do it um, is through um, the uh, introduction of a uh, universe of, of, of a um, uh, basic income guarantee. Precarity in work is the way in which the artistic sector currently thrives. What we want to see is a system very similar to that which is recommended to be introduced in the Republic of Ireland, fought for hard by our sister unions over there, which guarantees a basic income for artists. It makes sure that innovative um, productions, a precarious industry does not militate against um, stable lives and stable livelihoods. That is a big part of democratizing the industry, is delivering a universal uh, basic income for our members, a basic income guarantee. And then finally, this, this is the question about cooperatizing. How do we make sure that it's not bureaucrats in boxes making decisions about public funding, but the workforce who creates their capital in the industry? the workforce that creates the art in the industry and the audiences that want to see and consume. What we want to see is the arts councils broken up and distributed around the UK with audiences and artists having a genuine control over the workplaces that they have. That is new. That is not the way it has ever operated in this country and it is what we need. And it will lead to economic dynamism within the sector. This is a sector already worth more to the British economy than banking. Imagine what will happen if you put the people who are in control um, of the ideas that create that capital in control of the capital itself. It can only be a flourishing of sustainable, carbon friendly, um, socially important work. We can get hung up on the, economics, uh, the, the economic arguments about the arts, which are important to make because they're real. But the truth is, there is a real important social value about how we gel together as a society, how we talk about the big issues of the age. And that is a big part of cooperatizing our industry. And, and I'll, I'll make a final kind of cheeky reference to how this applied to Equity's other motion at the TUC this year as well about Channel 4. We can very often get a bit hung up about live performance and live performance alone it is really important. Getting art out of buildings, into communities, getting funding decisions out of offices in London and putting them into uh, Leeds, Manchester, Birmingham, Liverpool, Bristol, Norwich and so on. That is really, really important. But what about our broadcasters? What about the east-west divide in broadcasting? Decentralising from London should not mean centralising in Manchester. And when Channel 4 makes the good and bold decision to move to Leeds, why is it sold off to a pack of uh, braying hyenas who are desperate to turn it into a profit-making enterprise. That's not right. Audiences deserve that. But we as unions can't demand with Channel 4 or with the Arts Councils a little bit less of what we've got now and a little bit more of what we had before. What we need to be saying is we want something different. 
a change, a change that genuinely puts power in the hands of artists and of audiences. And a cooperatization of broadcast, of the BBC, of uh, Channel 4, and indeed um, of access to other broadcast uh, media is really, really, really important too. So yes, it's about theatre. Yes, it's about variety. Yes, it's about broadcast. And um, that is the vision that the motion has put together. And I'll finish with this. It is so brilliant to be joined um, by representatives from um, all of the other creative unions here today. And I can see lots of faces um, of our supporters here. But I also know there are people here who come from outside our sector. This motion was carried unanimously by trades unionists. And it is only with that singular solidarity and understanding that our struggles in trying to get our industries um, cooperatised are the same as those for British gas workers, the same as those for haulage workers, the same as um, our carers, the same as people who've uh, been on the front line um, of healthcare and social care and deliveries in uh, the gig economy um, across the pandemic, our struggles are the same. And to have their support, the support of six million trades unionists for a sector that's worth more to the British economy than banking, that is the hallmark of a civilized society, that is the cornerstone of progressing um, to a carbon neutral, um, socially responsible, um, inclusive future, is um, a real testament, I think, to where the trade union movement is today. So hopefully that is enough. Thank you so much um, for that contribution. And I know um, that you need to uh, leave now, so I appreciate you coming in your busy schedule. Um, you, you, you've got me till 20 to eight. So. Oh, okay, all right, great. Um, so our next speaker is Naomi Paul. Naomi is Deputy General Secretary of the Musicians' Union, which represents over 30,000 musicians. Over the past 12 months, they've been campaigning for better support for their members and for the live music sector to reopen swiftly and safely. They are also campaigning on the impact of Brexit, on touring and for better music streaming royalties for musicians. Welcome, Naomi. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I'm going to talk a bit about the impact of COVID uh, on our membership um, and then move on to our element of the composite motion, which was um, focusing particularly on music streaming. So the COVID-19 crisis for musicians was um, the worst crisis in our union's history. Um, I think the previous uh, crisis that was um, that impacted members on a, a kind of significant level was probably when um, cinemas stopped hiring orchestras and they moved to having um, the talkies. Um, so it's something that we never thought we'd see. Um, all of our members' workplaces closed overnight um, and there was no work and no income at all. Um, for 40% of our members, they didn't qualify for either the furlough scheme or for the self-employed income support scheme. And about 90% of our members are self-employed. They had no safety net. Um, so in the first few months of the crisis, we saw over 20,000 applications to music industry hardship funds, including our own hardship fund. Um, and, uh, you know, we very much support uh, what Paul was saying about having a basic income for, um, for artists so that... Uh, that we don't find ourselves in that position again. Um, we also need the government to recognise that there are genuinely self-employed people out there. So not all self-employment is bogus self-employment. Um, our members are genuinely self-employed and we are the gig economy, the original gig economy, because our members will be working for one engager one day and then they might go on and the next day work for several different engagers. It's not It's not continuous in that way, but their careers have been very much viable careers um, in the arts. So during the crisis, we've been lobbying for more support for our members and particularly those who fell through the cracks of the government support schemes. Um, we've also been working extremely hard to try and get work places opened again um, and safely reopened. Um, and particularly the live sector, it's obviously taken a long time to get back to a point where um, we can talk about live performances happening again. Um, but I want to focus particularly on uh, music streaming because that was the, our contribution to the composite motion. Um, and it's been a really interesting campaign for us to run actually. Um, the reason it came about during the COVID crisis is that when our members were unable to earn an income working, suddenly they were forced to rely on the royalties that they received through collecting societies and those royalties took on a new significance. Um, and uh, our members um, earn, royalties from 
um, use of their performances uh, in recorded media. Um, they earn from radio broadcasts, for example, uh, and also songwriters earn from live performances of their works. Um, we don't earn uh, those kind of royalties from um, music streaming. So the way that music streaming works is that uh, the record labels own the rights in the recordings. And when they're put out on music streaming platforms, um, the labels essentially get the lion's share of the money. And this is essentially a campaign about fa fa fairer pay and, uh, and fairer contracts. So music streaming and the music industry in general are dominated by three major labels um, who hold all the power uh, our members who are entering the industry absolutely desperate to get a foothold in music um, don't have any bargaining power at all. And they're presented with contracts which they have no choice but to sign. It's practically coercive. Um, there's no negotiation that takes place. Um, and then we can find that our members are trapped into those contracts for very long periods of time and that their works no longer generate them any kind of fair income. Um, and this can't go on. We need uh, recorded music to support our members in the same way that live performance does. And unfortunately, we've realized that um, the live performance sector could be extremely fragile. Um, so uh, what was interesting about our fixed streaming campaign is that it actually started as a grassroots movement of artists. So there's a campaign called Broken Record, which is run by um, Tom Gray, who's a musician from the band Gomez. Um, he started a campaign on Twitter and we quickly followed with the fixed streaming campaign, which is effectively the organized industry and union equivalent. Um, and we've worked really closely together. There's been a DCMS um, select committee inquiry into music streaming, which was extremely detailed. So they got representatives of the major labels up to um, defend themselves and their practices. Um, they had uh, Horace Truebridge, our general secretary, uh, representatives of artists. They had the artists themselves, the managers got involved. It was inc incredibly thorough. And their report came out with many recommendations that were really positive for um, creators and performers. Um, so that's fantastic. And we were awaiting the government's response to the select committee inquiry report. We expect that tomorrow. Um, so hopefully we'll have some really positive news tomorrow. Um, we've had a lot of support for our campaign. There's a private members bill going for its second reading in Parliament on the 2nd of uh, December or the 3rd of December, um, which is going to be calling for equitable remuneration on music streaming. Essentially, that means a guaranteed royalty for all musicians, that's featured artists and session musicians, um, on every stream. And it would be uh, collected and distributed by a collecting society. So much fairer than the system that we have at the moment. Um, and equitable remuneration essentially is fair pay. And we're calling for fairer contracts, which I know is something that all the unions can get behind because it's something we've talked about a lot during the uh, TUC Congress this year. Um, so that's my uh, big ask, um, fairer royalties, fairer pay and fairer contracts for musicians moving forward. Thank you so much, um, Naomi. Our next speaker is Dave O'Brien. Dave is Chancellor's Fellow in Cultural and Creative Industries at the University of Edinburgh and a co-investigator at the Arts and Humanities Research Council's Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Centre. He has published extensively on inequality in the creative economy including his latest book, Culture is Bad for You, which is co-authored with Drs. Mark Taylor and Orion Brooke. This week, he has co-authored new research on the crisis of social mobility in creative industries, published by the AHR AHRCPC and the Creative Majority Report on what works to support diversity in the creative industries, published by the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Creative Diversity. Thank you very much. Over to you, Dave. Uh, thanks. And um, that sounds like a lot. Uh, sorry to, to kind of take up so much time with uh, just, just an introduction. Um, I'm going to try and say three things uh, in my time. Um, the, the first thing I, I think responds uh, to, to what we've already heard and the challenge of getting, you know, fairer, uh, better, more secure work for the sector is, is really crucial because the working conditions uh, in the sector 
go some way, not entirely, but some way to explaining um, why we've got the kind of demographic problems um, around representation of those who are basically not posh white men um, at the top um, of kind of senior decision making spaces across the creative industries, whether that's um, film and television, theatre, music, um, but into fashion, design, um, and you know, museums, galleries, the, the kind of state funded sector. Um, that said, I do want to raise a couple of challenges, uh, if that's okay. Um, and I, I guess they're kind of questions um, around UBI on, on the one hand, but, but also questions um, of what a, a sort of cooperativized uh, sector would look like when we think seriously about uh, the demographics in the sector. And in order to do that, I'm just going to talk about a little bit of research that um, a few of us published a couple of weeks ago, which was looking at um, the, I guess, the kind of the digital moment that happened during the pandemic. So, you know, the kind of narrative is everybody was locked in their houses and, and you know, everybody was kind of returning to arts and culture to, to sort of get them, get them through the pandemic. Um, we looked at um, the government's data, uh, so this thing called Taking Part, and we also looked at audience agency data. Um, which it was a kind of commissioned nationally representative survey. And basically what we found was there was little to no evidence that the majority of the population had kind of switched to digital uh, and had drawn on arts and culture to, to kind of get, get through things. Actually, the vast majority of the population were not particularly heavily engaged in um, anything apart from watching television and reading before the pandemic. Um, and that just carried on. Um, a tiny proportion of the population who are already kind of like heavy users, if I can use that term, of culture pre-pandemic uh, became heavy digital users and, and, and found new routes um, into cultural engagement during the pandemic through digital means. But I raise this because it's an interesting story of, of I guess, the kind of the distance between where the sort of demographics of audiences are and where I, I guess the sort of uh, assumptions that um, the cultural sector has about what's going on with audiences. And this is unfortunately the same with the workforce as well. Um, so the stuff we published last week with the Policy and Evidence Centre suggests there's a real kind of class crisis uh, going on with the dominance of those from, from middle class starting points. Um, and that dominance is particularly pronounced in what we think of as the, the kind of core cultural industries, so film and television, um, parts of, of performing uh, arts and music, uh, and also in publishing as well. And the, the challenge really is to how to think about um, changing those workforce demographics by making work more secure, but also thinking about what that means in terms of audiences, because to, to be blunt about it, if a sort of, you know, world changing um, pandemic didn't change audience behavior, then, you know, we, we need to think seriously about what might. And, and in that context, I, I guess the question comes of, of what works. So, you know, yesterday we launched this um, Creative Industries, um, Creative Diversity um, report that has been mentioned, uh, was published by the All Party Parliamentary Group for Creative Diversity. Uh, and what should be hopefully really interesting in, in the kind of uh, TUC and cross union context was how so much of what we were talking about was to do with things that are kind of HR contracts, enforcement of the Equality Act. Um, you know, a lot of the kind of the tools for fair work, I think, are already there, but really, you know, kind of enforcement and to an extent education is what's lacking. And to summarize, because I've, I've had my three minutes, I think being cautious is important when we think about things like UBI, um, or kind of handing control over to audiences and, and workforces, because to be blunt, what you're going to do is end up massively subsidizing those who are already very affluent and giving control to those who are effectively a kind of posh, white, um, and in, in senior roles, male, highly unrepresentative sector of the population. I think what can be great about the UBI debate and where you know we, we've heard um, some, some of the kind of interventions already is to think about creative workers work and what kind of things the workers across Britain need um, to make, you know, kind of life 
uh, sustainable. And, and, you know, in this context, that I draw your attention to you know, maybe a campaign more broadly um, for the transformation of the welfare state, thinking, as we saw uh, yesterday, around questions of, of, you know, cost of childcare, um, things that I, I guess, you know, have been raised in the creative context. There was some very good work out of the University of Nottingham last week about the impact um, of the pandemic on on mothers, which has been you know kind of kind of devastating in terms of their creative careers. But you know we shouldn't see that just as a kind of campaign for creative justice. But actually, we need to think I think about campaigns for social justice more broadly. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, our next speaker is Philippa Charles. I think I've seen Philippa here. Yes, I'm here. Oh, hi. lovely. Hi, hi Philippa. Um, nice. Actually, uh, uh, you know what? I was supposed to call Gareth next, but if you're here, if you're okay, I'll call you because I've now said your name. But I should, it was I put, I've done it in the wrong order. But you're you're here now. Is that all right with you, Gareth, as well? Yeah, that's fine. No okay. Worries. So Philippa is the head of Bectu, um since the retirement of Jerry Morrissey in 2018. Back to merge with Prospect in 2017. The pandemic therefore presented a huge learning curve for her, but has also provided an opportunity to ensure that the voice of freelance members working across the creative industries was heard by government. Thank you very much, Philippa. Welcome. Thanks, Eta. Um, and you'll have to excuse me because unfortunately I was at another meeting earlier, so I hope that I'm not repeating everything that other people have said. I'll certainly try not to. But obviously, um, Beck2, for those who don't know, represents members who work, free, uh, freelance and employed members who work across film and TV, theatre, broadcasting, gaming and live events. So we've got quite a broad range of, of members. And um, just in recent times, I suppose the balance has tipped uh, towards freelance members. So we've now got more freelancers uh, as members um, than we have as in, uh, in collective bargaining or, or em employed members, if you like. Um, for, the, for the first time, you know, the balance was always uh, the, the other way. And, and I suppose I think that, that that's almost inevitable that that's going to continue um, to grow. Uh, and, you know, certainly the all of the, the press around recently around film and TV and the creative industry suggests that um, there is a skill shortage. There's going to be lots more film and TV production coming to the UK. Studios are expanding and they're going to want, um, uh, you know, people who are who, who are skilled and able to pick up those roles and I think for me that provides lots of opportunities but we obviously collectively uh, I think it's important that we make sure that uh, with those opportunities comes better uh, terms and conditions, um, better work-life balance, uh, more diversity and altogether a, a better deal for freelancers, which is what Beck2 have been campaigning around um, since I suppose the impact of the pandemic showed to everyone uh, in, in this sector, uh, how fragile the situation is for, for freelancers. And so many, I'm sure as other people have talked about, have fallen through the gaps of government support during the pandemic, which has devastated lives and, you know, really impacted people's mental health and so on. So I think um, one of the things that we've been quite focused on um, is, and, and Prospect, our parent union, uh, conducted a, a review along along with community and others in uh, into self-employment and what we might like to see change in terms of self-employment going forward and unsurprisingly the things that came out of that were around you know um the things that that people who are employed can enjoy like you know pe better pension provision um the the ability to to have uh, maternity and paternity leave um uh sick pay so you know i'm really interested in what uh keir starmer had to say today about sick pay being extended and i think we all certainly want to make sure that that included freelancers going forward 
Um, but I suppose the, the important thing for me was that despite all of our campaigning and the campaigning of lots of people across the industry um, during the pandemic, we weren't able to get government to fill those gaps. Um, and that's a huge disappointment to me. Not, you know, uh, we, the self-employed income support scheme was a positive initiative, but there were just so many who fell between the gaps of the various schemes. And, and I think the problem within government is there were voices who were interested in that debate, but freelancers and, and freelance uh, engagement I mean, there, there just isn't anyone who is speaking for freelancers. So, so one of the things that we've been calling for, and I think alongside others like the Creative Industries Federation, is, is for a, a freelance commissioner who it can be really focused on the different types of freelance employment because it's many and there are many and varied patterns of freelancer as we know um freelancer is a catch-all term but we know that that terms of engagement can be very different um so i think what we would really like to see is uh someone within someone with influence potentially within government who can really speak about all of the things that impact freelancers neg potentially negatively and yes somebody just mentioned um, universal credit and how that interacts with with freelance engagement and so on but but there are many things you know there is there is the um the the benefit system there is there are issues around uh, flexible working there are issues around tax obviously um many many things that no one in government was speaking very uh coherently about i suppose and as much as we tried and we we you know uh collectively lobbied the tuc lobbied um i i certainly feel that if going forward and i uh, i've already said that i think there's going to be more freelance engagement, not less, that we need to make sure that there is a voice for freelancers and that we collectively as unions are speaking as loudly about freelance work and freelance engagement and making sure that it is good work and that, that people um, have the same access to dignity at work, to use the uh, uh, slogan from this week, then, then we, we need to speak as loudly for freelance workers as we do for um, employed workers. So that's, that's really my ask, I suppose, or my, my ambition would be to make sure there was someone in government who was, um, who, who was speaking uh, you know, with experience and knowledge about freelance engagement. Thank you very much, um, Philippa. Our next speaker is Gareth Spencer, and um, thank you for that, Gareth. Um, Gareth is from my other union, the PCS, and is the branch organiser for PCS South Bank Centre, the president of the PCS Culture Group, which represents 4,000 workers in the UK's national museums, galleries, libraries, art centres, charities, and also in the DCEMS. Welcome, Gareth. Thank you, Zita, and um, thank you to all the other speakers for your contributions so far. Um, hopefully I can add um, something uh, interesting um, to, the, to the overall conversation. Um, so as Zita said, uh, PCS represents um, a large number of workers across the country. Um, across many national institutions, um, as well as the big kind of the big guns of the culture sector in, in London, like South Bank and the Tate and the British Museum. Um, I'll talk probably mostly about how COVID um, has impacted uh, our members and then um, what we kind of plan to do next. Um, COVID hit the culture sector or PCS culture sector um, on the back of a decade of austerity. Um, so museums, galleries, Libraries have been implementing a decade's worth of Tory cuts, uh, pay freezes. Some institutions have been allowed to dip into their own money through the museum's freedom, but they were, you know, obviously robbing themselves to, to, to cover costs. Um, overall, the sector had become reliant on income from shops, from events and from hiring out spaces to um, companies that would pay to use the spaces rather than having them open to the public. Um, a widespread privatisation across the sector of functions like security, front of housework, cleaning, um, 
so all this uh when when covid hit meant that a lot of our institutions lost their funding and income overnight um such as my own at South Bank Centre, they only had a couple of months worth of money kind of in the kitty to keep going. So whilst the appeals to the to the government and to DCMS uh, were heard and, and the fellow scheme did come through, it became very apparent to our members that this was money to save buildings, not workers. Um, government was only really concerned with sort of mothballing culture, um, didn't really care about what state it would be in, um, for the reopening, provided the buildings were still there. And um, we saw thousands of redundancies across our sector. Uh, we had a wave of strikes, protests and ballots across institutions like the Tate, South Bank Centre, VNA, and historic royal palaces. Um, these kind of intersected with the Black Lives Matter movement as well. And we noticed that a lot of our members um, were being disproportionately targeted. They were from Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups. They were concentrated in the kind of roles that we represent in PCS, so front of house, security, cleaning, um, compared to you know, people in managerial roles or curatorial roles, which are overwhelmingly white. Um, privatization is still ongoing um, across the sector. Um, at the Imperial War Museum earlier this year, um, the Imperial War Museum has given 10 million pounds to a company called ZE Global to run the entire front of house operation. When they gave that company the contract, uh, they only had 11 employees and were working in online security. So they've now inherited like 100 workers. They've then since proceeded to implement a massive um, redundancy scheme. Um, we've seen um, cleaners at the British Museum victimized um, at the hands of an outsourced employer. At the Royal Parks, our members have been on strike um, quite heroically for the last few weeks, and they're going on strike again for the whole of October. Um, they're employed again by an outsourced contractor, and they're demanding to be brought in-house so that they can enjoy the same rights as their directly employed colleagues in the charity. So I think when we talk about like how do we rebuild, um, we need to look at these, these issues that have come, come about during COVID. Um, so we do need to talk about funding. We need to talk about how the sector is funded and it's not just reliant on commercial income and private sponsors and that kind of thing. We need to talk about bringing services in house. We need to talk about ending the endemic privatization that we see across our cultural institutions. We talk about making a green recovery. Um, the culture sector workers have been behind Culture declares emergency has supported the school strikes, but we still see uh, the pernicious influence of oil sponsorship in institutions like the British Museum and the Science Museum. Um, workers in those institutions don't want to be funded with oil money and they don't want exhibition content or curatorial decisions made by oil sponsors. And um, as other speakers have said, we need to talk about equality. We need to end the kind of pale male and stale hierarchy that runs our institutions. A quick glance at the top um, visitor attractions in London will only show you that, yes, there are lots of older white men still in charge of these organisations. I think what we need to look at is some of the roots of the organisations, particularly my own South Bank Centre was founded in 1951 um, as part of the Festival of Britain. Um, we need to kind of return to that spirit of providing well-funded uh, really accessible cultural institutions for everyone. Um, so I think that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gareth. Um, last but not least, our final speaker, and then we'll open it up for contributions, is Mike Wayne. And Mike is a professor in media and film at Brunel University and EUCU representative on CLIC and is the co-author of Making Culture Ours. Welcome. Thanks, Zita. Yeah, I want to uh, just introduce uh, Making Culture Ours, and um, I put a link to it in the chat, so you can, you can click directly to it. Um, so Making Culture Ours um, is, was produced by a working group um, of CLIC, which is the Culture 
Leisure Industries Committee, <coughs> um, which sits inside uh, the London East Southeast region of the TUC. Uh, Making Culture Ours is a discussion document, um, that's all, but it, it functions as a platform really for advocacy of these issues uh, inside the, the trade union and labour movement and, and you know, beyond as well. I think the important thing about CLIC is that it's, um, it's a multi-union organ. Um, there are delegates from a whole range of culture sector unions, uh, Equity, uh, BEC2, PCS, um, Unite, uh, Artists Union England, and my own union, um, UCU. And I think that um, helps give Making Culture Ours um, a broad vision um, that makes it relevant to a whole range of different stakeholders. And hopefully um, this is this fringe meeting uh, for us anyway, uh, in relation to CLIC, this fringe meeting is uh, the start of uh, a campaign to intervene in these debates um, and to raise people's expectations uh, that we can have better and that uh, another culture sector is possible. Um, so for example, you know, the, uh, our central economic funding proposal in regards to public investment is that the UK's uh, spending on arts and culture should be raised more or less double it uh, to 1% of GDP. And that would bring it in line with the uh, average uh, of spending in, in Europe. Um, I mean, you know, it depends exactly what you um, include in the word culture, but, you know, it broadly, it's, it's a good uh, target. It's a reasonable demand and it's a good slogan. The slogan, something like, you know, uh, raise culture spending by 1% of G to 1% of GDP and improve our lives by 100%. So this is part of what we need to do. We need to, um, you know, make the case for uh, the fact that there's such a paltry amount of public spending in arts and culture, comparatively speaking, uh, and that, um, you know, it is in fact a realistic demand to increase that if we, we look at comparisons uh, on the continent. Although I do realise that these days to be realistic in this country is to demand the impossible. Um, but nevertheless, uh, once we can establish a solid economic base um, and have a thriving public sector, you know, we need that in order to establish security and stability and sustainability and, and, and a benchmark for, you know, good working conditions. Um, we, we need that because unless we, we do that, we're not going to overcome the scarcity principle, um, which, you know, it makes it very difficult to, with, you know, if you're under the thumb of the scarcity principle, uh, it makes it very difficult for you to really address the already existing entrenched demographic and geographical inequalities. Um, all, the, all the figures, the uh, uh, stats that are used to trumpet the growth of the arts and culture sector cannot hide that it rests on a large pool of flexibly exploited labor. And also I think um, it cannot hide that at the top of our arts and culture institutions is a tiny elite um, who have, you know, controlling, you know, they're getting the best opportunities and they're controlling uh, the, the, the key positions of power and they've cut a path to that position uh, through the private school and Oxbridge network. I don't think we can stop talking about, about that. Uh, but making culture ours is about more than just economics as other people have been saying, uh, very much very Paul Fleming here um, and making culture ours uh, sort of does have some significant overlaps I think with uh, equities uh, performance for all, but it's, it is about changing the social relationships of production and consumption. It's about democratizing uh, the arts. I think that means two things. I think it means firstly infusing our existing public uh, structures with a new ethos of expanded participation and that includes um, you know local authorities, you know historically uh, big spenders in this area, although now obviously uh, their arts budgets are being cut to the bone. It includes public service broadcasting around which in fact there is actually has been a long, struggle, a double fight really, to both widen public participation and also fend off the predatory um, 
you know, private capital interests that are circling around it. Uh, but it also, I think, making culture ours means new structures uh, as well, more decentralized structures and more grassroots structures. So, for example, one proposal in making culture ours is for regional culture councils uh, on which uh, practitioners and um, local community representatives sit. Uh, another example, a more grassroots example, would be uh, the development of cultural youth centers, uh, really targeting working class areas and working class demographics. So I think uh, making culture ours requires a fight against both commodification um, and uh, you know, resistance to that, like we saw in the summer, in fact, uh, against the uh, the plans to create a, a European Super League in football. And it uh, requires a fight against uh, the class stratified control of culture and the intersection of class with other significant uh, demographics, uh, such as race and gender. So please do read Making Culture Ours and get involved in that discussion. Thank you so much, Mike, and thank you to um, all of our speakers for your fantastic contributions and for all the suggestions you've made on um, what can take us forward. And I think it's really cu crucial. I'm glad that quite a lot of speakers have spoken about equality issues because the 10 years of austerity that we had had already amplified the discrimination that already existed in the sector um, for black and women, disabled and other equality groups as an impact on young people coming forward and trying to enter the industries and, you know, kickstart their um, careers. And all of that has been fueled by the pandemic and made it worse. I think any cultural recovery has to ensure that it addresses inequality and discrimination and there's no going back to where we were. We don't want to go back. We need to go forward because we weren't in a good place in the first place when it came to um, equality. So I'd like to um, open it up now for contributions. I can see somebody already got their hand up, got in there fast. Um, that's good. So if you um, would like to speak, if you click on reactions at the bottom and then you can raise your hand there. So we have um, not that long, we've got about 15 minutes and I just you know, want to um, have some concluding remarks. So I'm gonna bring in as many contributions as I can, but if you can keep them as short as you're able to, then I'll be able to bring in more. So the first person was um, Doug and then um, uh, John and Teresa. I'm gonna bring those three in first of all, Doug, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really quite heartened by the, uh, by what's been going on uh, this week. But something I think we we mustn't forget is the we, we need now to actually build on where um, on where we've arrived on our uh, on on these notable achievements, uh, which means a commitment from the national unions from the top and also from uh, the rank and file level, uh, nothing, um, motions and such from, uh, uh, and declarations of intent uh, mean nothing unless there's, a, uh, unless there's something behind them. So I would like to see the unions at the top level getting together and us and the rest of us actually working on the ground and working with other unions, as most, most of us do, uh, at every level, down to trades councils, et cetera, and actually really make this work. Because I honestly believe that it can work if we, uh, if we fight it, but we're not actually going to get very far, very far just waiting for the Tory government to, uh, to see reason. Thank you, sorry to go so long. Thanks. Thank you very much, Doug. And um, I'll bring in John next. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was the lead writer on Making Culture Hours and Performance for All, so uh, it's understandable some of the policies are quite similar. I think the three key things are about increasing funding 
to European levels, which would be a 66% increase on current DCMS allocations. As Paul Fleming was referring to a balance, socially responsive and democratized funding and fully inclusive representation for all creative workers and audiences. Now that would actually change our industry from being highly centralized and unbalanced and run without accountability according to a business profit model into an artistically and socially beneficial model. So arts and culture have an instrumental value for mental health, learning, the economy, and so on, but they have an intrinsic value that is actually irreplaceable because they address our whole humanity, our empathic understanding of each other, society, and our future potential. Now that future potential needs to be emphasized just as health and care sector needs a, a completely radical new model, just as the economy needs greening. So we need a sea change in our arts industry, a new model of funding and organization and an end to the historic philistinism of governments who diminish our value. So we have to promote these documents and the vision as a whole. But there is a vital connection between our as yet unrealized policies and what we do now when faced with cuts and closures as a result of austerity and COVID. How we fight to defend a shut theater, a silent music venue, a closed visual art space will affect how we succeed in winning support for the expanded arts industry we want. So our trade union branches, our committees, our leaderships, our, our networks, like the National Campaigners Network that's been set up in equity recently, all need to focus on reopening venues, but not only that, on opening new ones by extending local public ownership. So I wanna to refer to a, a very important campaign happening now to save Stratford Circus. Newham Council, the Labour Council evicted funded professional arts organizations from this arts center in order to establish a youth zone. The North and East London Equity Branch organizing the campaign is applying policies from our documents and demanding that the council commit to a full spectrum professional arts provision, as well as the youth hub. Reinstatement of the displaced organizations and also, crucially, for local trade union and community involvement in determining the future administration and programming of the venue. Now that's just one example. We can also be demanding local meetings for creative workers with councils, arts and leisure departments, businesses, to determine local arts provision. We can urge local authorities to take into public ownership unused business and retail premises, many of which have been closed as a result of COVID, and establish new public culture centers for rehearsal and performance, visual arts, variety, entertainment, and music, all of course at low affordable rents. So I think we have to look at a two-pronged strategy practical campaigning on the ground while pursuing the future vision of these documents with government parties, funders and governments. Thank you very much, John. So I've now got indicated to speak, Theresa followed by Aisha, hope that's pronounced correctly, and Lorraine. Um, and then I'm going to see where we are for time because we are coming to a close for our time. Theresa, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's just a quick one, really, but it's thinking about funding, you know, and if we're demanding more funding, um, we need to have more transparency with funding because some issues that come up regularly from Artists Union England members and regional organiser in the North East is how there's lack of funding on how artists are actually paid. So organisations apply to um, institutions like the Arts Council but the Arts Council will not divulge how those organisations are paying artists. And this happened recently with some freelancers who asked the Tate for a freedom of information request and the Tate basically refused. So I think if we are looking at more investment and particularly regional investment, 
we need to have some kind of structure in place to make the funding accountable so we can say exactly what's going on. It'd be interesting to know if any of the trade unions have had discussions at, at that kind of level about this. That's all, thanks. Thanks, Trader. Um, Aisha? Yeah, good evening. Um, two points, uh, one's an opinion and one's a question. And one actually builds on a point that Theresa just made. Um, I think, but it, it goes slightly deeper. I think that there's a kind of public support and engagement exercise for the arts and culture section. Um, and there's still a view that culture is seen as a luxury and not for the masses. And I think there's an opportunity of engagement with parents and careers in terms of um, people really getting to grips with, it's not just entertainment, people work and live in these sectors and a lot more of the youth are gravitating towards the cultural sector. So just demystifying that, I think would be something that would um, make some impact there. Um, and really to underpin that is the point that the football uh, in relation to the league had a lot of public grassroots support and pushback. And my second point is, well, it's question, is education's gone through a lot of the challenges and issues that are being raised across the creative um, sector. Um, what cognizance, what, what lessons have been learned from what happened to education um, have people taken into account in this context? So those are my two points. Thank you so much, Aisha. So I've got final two contributions um, from Lorraine and Fran, and then I'm going to come back to our panel briefly. Thank you, Lorraine. You're on mute. No, I know, I know, I just couldn't do it. Hi, yeah, sorry, so, uh, yeah, Joint Chair of Artist Union. Um, and just wanted to say, I think that we really need to take the positives from this as well. The positives of us getting that composite motion through, the fact that we were doing it jointly as art, uh, as artists, creative unions, um, and having meetings like this, and hopefully this will just be the beginning of a whole load more, where we can have a kind of united front about what needs to go forward and supporting one another, supporting each other's members, and really, as everyone said before, tackling those the questions and uh, and prejudices that might be around cr creative arts um, and obviously from artist union point of view a lot of our members were in a really poor state before covid so even before the pandemic most of our members were, do were doing two or three jobs and even with that they weren't earning ten thousand a year and I mean, I just left, I left people meeting people today at an exhibition and all it was talking about was all the different jobs people were doing. Very few of them were actually paid jobs in the, in the creative sector that they had decided to work in. So that is a fundamental thing for us in terms of having that kind of equality, which is why we think that um, the um, UBI is a, certainly one of the things that we should be looking at why we want pilots done for it, um, because we think that it will be the one that would address diversity, most of all, as long as obviously there are special extra payments for those who would be getting extra payments anyway within the benefit system. But so I think we need to be positive about it, keep, keep on going with it, um, but really recognising that to, to work in the creative industry, it's so tough. And, and Theresa's point about um, transparency. I mean, the Arts Council, I just like to you know, just get rid of it and start again. I mean, the whole thing seems to me doesn't actually serve any kind of purpose. And we could really, I'm sure all of our unions could come up with a better blueprint for it. So I'm really pleased that we've had this opportunity and I hope we have a whole load more. Thank you. Thanks, Lorraine. And finally, Fran. Thanks. Um, I, was, I was one of the writing P4A and um, for hours, and I'm the chair of CLIC. And what I'm really fascinated by is having come out of the alternative theatre movement years ago, is I can still see how those of us who create new and unexpected work are still moving away. I, I, went, I, I think that we have to think when we put the work on these documents together, what is coming next? what's in the future and how we deal with the notion that arts and poverty 
desperation and lack of money are creative cultural bases. The arguments I've had with people to say we don't need to accept not having any pay. But oddly enough, that obsession, that, that, that commitment to, to endure is highly creative, highly courageous, and highly, in lots of ways, oddly admirable. I've been arguing with it for years. I want to be voted as a central. Our document, we went through the documents with them and they got the shock of their lives. Because there's a lot of very interesting people in there who have not thought that the future for us and for the next generations is a realistic. So I think these documents are absolutely crucial. But we have to think quite hard. We've also got to think about what you do with employers. I went to one of the employers' organisations and pushed the document forward, and they didn't even understand what I was talking about. They did not have a view of an industry that had a, a proper future with work, jobs and creativity for people. So we have a fascinating task, and we all know we have, which is a terrific, a terrific strength that we know what we've got and what we can do. So, yes, thank you, everybody. I'm moved, very moved. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bren. Um, So we're nearly out of time, and I know there were a couple of questions. So I am going to come back to um, uh, any panel members are still here. With the permission of the meeting, um, you know, we are able to just run a couple of minutes more. I do understand that some people need to go, though. Um, I want to, though, before I do that, just say some thank you. So I do want to thank um, all of our speakers. Um, I want to thank everybody that's contributed and everybody that's attended. And special thanks need to go to people that have been doing lots of work behind the scenes in the run-up to this meeting and um, during the meeting. So special thanks go to Tom, to Martin, to Pam, and to Eviana, thank you very much for all the work you've done to make sure this meeting happened and I had all my notes and everything I needed to know in order to be able to chair it, much appreciated. Um, so there were a couple of questions, are any of the panel um, speakers, do any of the panel speakers want to respond to those questions? And you've literally got one minute because we're at the end now to say something, which isn't much, but um, you're welcome to come in. Yep, Mike. Yeah, I mean... Um, There's sorry, a lot of feedback. Um, if anybody's no, not on mute, is. could you put yourselves on mute? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I think the... Uh, you know, fighting the cuts uh, to hold on as much as we can now is really important. And at the same time, we need to sort of win the debates inside the trade union and the labour movement regarding uh, the importance of arts and culture. You know, it's not um, a feather bedded sector of the privilege, whatever the class background of uh, people in the sector, most people actually are working in a highly exploitative conditions. It's, uh, but there is at the top, there's a privileged sector at the top uh, who, you know, they have the decision-making powers. Um, but I think, um, you know, arts culture, in, arts culture is, should be seen as, as fundamental as health and education. It's the place where we have those conversations about who we are um, and who we want to be and what our problems and possibilities are. So, you know, uh, we do also then need to change the social relations of production and consumption in terms of access and, and, and who's involved uh, in order to widen and diversify those possibilities. So I just wanted to say, you know, it's not a luxury. And I, 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 um, it's a shame Dave's not, not still here because I, I wanted to just kind of come back on, on that. I, I thought he slightly presented um, the arts and culture sector as, as possibly sort of, you know, dominated quantitatively by, by those kind of people, but I think they're, they're just at the top. I'm on mute now. Thanks very much, um, Mike, and I'm going to bring Naomi in next. Thank you. 
Yes, just on um, on working together, I think we have done that quite effectively, actually, during the crisis. I think we've all been echoing each other's arguments. There's been a lot of the similar issues that affect all of our members working in this sector. So I actually think that we've been really effective. I think, you know, it was a really real disappointment that we didn't get the gaps in the government um, schemes filled in. But that's something that I think we all really argued for and we were very united. So I just leave that as a positive thought. Um, I think we've got to campaign for fairer contracts, fairer pay, as I said. Um, and I think we've got to use everything in our arsenal. So, um, you know, campaigning through collective action, through negotiation, um, through lobbying the government um, and uh, and working together um, and involving our activists. Because um, again, with our fixed streaming campaign, which I talked about earlier, the reason that we've, we've had the success that we have with it has been because of the involvement of our members. Um, and because we've had a lot of high profile members who've got behind it and it was a grassroots movement. So again, I think that when that happens, it really does have a very positive impact. So thanks very much for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Any other speakers that are still with us want to say any final words? Now's your chance. No? Okay. Um, well, I'd like to thank everybody again for being here. Our work is cut out for us. There's a battle ahead of us. And that's why it's crucial that we work together not just within the trade union movement with it you know grassroots groups across the sector um we need arts and culture for our survival for healing um for a positive future it's important for education it's important for the next generation but it's important for us in the present too um and we need arts and culture to be properly funded to be accessible to all and to be equality proof at every level and to ensure that everybody has a platform in the arts um, and there is no room or space for discrimination. So I thank everybody here um, and let us continue to work together going forward and to do more things like this, like we have at the TUC, like we have tonight and wishing you all um, a pleasant evening and hope to see you uh, again soon in the virtual world and hopefully, um, you know, in the near future in the physical world as well. Take care and thank you very much for being here. Bye. Thank you, Zeta. Thanks, Zeta. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, Thank you. Well done. Thanks, everybody. Oh, Sheena. <laughs> You're visible. Been here all the time. Thanks, friend. Bye, all. Bye. Bye bye. Oh, there's Does Sheena. It, do our team want to just stay on for a couple of minutes yes, at the end? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. You. Hi. <laughs> I think I saved the chat. I hope so. Okay, I'm going to stop recording now. <laughs>